Oh, settle down. Oh. Settle down. Okay. Uh, now then, it's been a while. We, we sort of wandered off on a tangent um, where we were working on patching the test infra. Uh, so that it would work with the salt back end. Um, <clears throat> we're now in a position where we've got our two servers set up. Uh, and uh, we've got our data driven system. So we've got our two servers set up. So now uh, if we want to run all of the salt tests uh, we can do that uh, using this hosts uh, salt command so it will use um, the uh, the salt client that's running on the master server server 01 and it will use that to get a list of in this case all of the minions that's the star <clears throat> and it will use tests in this directory uh, which we're specifying uh, currently with the, the working directory so basically the test underscore firewall okay which is a very simple test at the moment all it does is it simply uh, tests if NFT is present okay and it does that by asserting that the nf tables package is installed right so running that you know, see it runs two tests basically uh, and we get one failed one passed and two warnings so let's just take a quick look at that uh, if we go back Okay, you can see that the first test succeeded. Uh, that's this little green dot, which is not admittedly not very visible. But the first green dot there is the pass that's test, and the F is the pass that failed. Uh, is the test that failed. So we can go down here to the failures and get some details. Uh, and you can see that the details here say that the problem is that the assertion failed, which is what we expect for at least one of them. Uh, and we can see that the host it failed on is server 02 and that's exactly correct because if you remember we had uh, applied nf tables to server 1 and we haven't applied it to server 2 uh, mainly to get this test to trigger so what we've got here is confirmation that server 2 certainly fails uh, and it fails because we get uh, false return from nf tables is installed uh, now, what about warnings? Uh, warnings. So we're getting a warning here from uh, Ginger, and it's deprecation warnings uh, due to the fact that it's sort of out of date. Now, that's not something we need to concern ourselves with at the moment. Uh, what we do need to consider is uh, if there's an update that would actually get rid of that. Uh, so what we ought to do is look at the ginger 2 package which is installed and see whether there's a more recent one <coughs> excuse me okay uh, but nothing particularly serious i don't like warnings generally uh, and this is something that bugs me actually about uh, development in general it's very easy to overlook warnings as being yeah, yeah they don't really matter uh, now, experience has told me that that is uh, a mistake, generally. <laughs> You're much better off getting rid of the warnings, in, in it, whether, whether it's about compiling code or whether it's like here, where it's a package which is outdated and needs updating. You should always keep these warnings in check uh, and wherever possible, get rid of them. Uh, because they're there for a reason you know warnings are not things to be ignored it, it, 
<laughs> they're treated quite often like things that are not a problem yeah so uh you know they're like a they're like an error that isn't really an error you know, we get we get fatal errors and then we get errors uh, and then we get warnings and people sort of treat warnings as eh. uh, and that's a really bad idea uh, generally speaking warnings should be eliminated one of two ways uh, warning should either be eliminated by explicitly telling your system to ignore that warning uh, and, and overlook it or warning should be eliminated by correcting the code to get rid of the warning now in this case it could be done by correcting the code uh, we'll have a look at that in a minute and <clears throat> see if we can track down a way of correcting it uh, but, but what you shouldn't do you shouldn't ignore them it's very easy to end up in a situation where you've got hundreds of warning coming out of a system and the problem with that is that it then drowns out warnings that might actually save you from making a horrible horrible mistake so wherever possible be defensive in in the way you manage your system and your code uh, and try and eliminate warnings as much as you would eliminate errors uh, it's too easy to uh, think of a warning as an error that isn't stopping you from going on. Yeah? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, errors, fatal or otherwise, yeah, errors stop you from doing something. Yeah, because when something when something is an error, it prevents you from actually doing something, uh, and therefore you have to fix it in order to progress. Yeah? A warning, on the other hand doesn't stop you from going on uh, and it's very easy to open Let, let's take this for example okay this is telling us that this thing is going to be deprecated now sure we can ignore it the problem is that we're accumulating debt here and it means that at some point in the none too distant future uh, this warning is going to become a breakage uh, so the sooner we fix it the better really now the problem actually lies in ginger 2 utils.py oh excuse me oh I'm very tired oh, due to the fact that somebody uh, has been waking me up at five o'clock in the morning uh, uh, yes it's all right for you you sleep through the day mm -hmm uh yeah so yeah so uh, long rambling speech over um yeah let, we will have a look at this in a minute and see whether we can't get an update to uh ginger 2 uh to get rid of this problem perhaps like we did with test infra we'll submit a uh, a fix uh, don't want to get too sidetracked too often though mm -hmm we'll see okay so we, we have a failed test uh, and the failed test and it, and it actually tells us here in summary the thing to look out for in this instance is which server has failed okay. now we could put specific test in um, and we could limit the 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 hosts on which this test is run uh, so that it only gets run on things that we know it's going to succeed on and in actual fact we could write a counter test which would test to, to make sure that that package wasn't installed when it wasn't needed um, why why might you want to do that well not having uh, <clears throat> not having something installed as it happens we're going to install the nf tables on all machines but um, not having a package installed uh, when it's not needed is a good idea because it reduces the amount of code on your system and reducing the amount of code in your system reduces the uh, attack surface so you can't accidentally end up with things on your system that might be exploited to compromise your system so as a general rule um, we want to remove things or not install things when they're not really needed this is particularly true by the way of anything that creates a, a network interface 
Now the firewall is particularly important because we want to be able to close the door to prevent anyone from getting into our system in the first place. And the firewall is our first line of defense. It's not our only line of defense, but it's certainly the first line of defense. But actually, I suppose the first line of defense is where the machine is physically located. But uh, in terms of what we can control with our software defined infrastructure, uh, the first line of defense is um, our network interface firewall. Okay. Uh, so we've accounted for our failed test, our pass test, and our warnings. Uh, so that's a reasonable start, okay? And as you can see, um, we've put all of those under our test, uh, test, test infra. Um, and as I, as, I, as I discussed before, we've put them all under test infra in order that um, uh, um, in order that uh we can separate out test infra from any other testing framework when we move forward if we might for example decide to put some salt tests in them uh, right uh, is there anything else to be said about this at the moment not really uh, we might look at ways of oh, oh let's take a look at that ginger um so what we want to do is uh we want to find out what version of ginger is installed uh now uh can pip do that oops uh pip three perhaps uh uh, now we can get the version of pip. Uh, and we can list the installed packages. Uh, ah, show information about installed packages. So I guess show. So let's do uh, pip3 show ginger2. Okay, so it's at version 2.10. Uh, now the question is, what is the latest version of Ginger? So uh, again, I would assume uh, that we can uh, let's do three search. Ginger 2 uh, Right, so uh, There's lots of Ginger 2 But the one we're looking for This in here, like, this is all garbage under it. Right, here we go. So we've got there we go. So here's our ginger two, okay, and it's telling us we've got two ten installed, but the latest is two eleven dot two. So I guess we can try just updating that. Uh, 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 let's just uh, let's do pip three install ginger two, which I think actually will do the update. Uh, mm. uh, no. Uh, how do we specify the particular version? Shows how often I do this. But there's no there's no point in remembering a lot of this like i said if you if you do this stuff regularly uh, then obviously it's going to stick 
but when you only do it ah, there you go minus u cool right, let's do um can't uninstall ginger 2 no files are found to uninstall who cares uh, installed to 11 right let's try running that test again and see whether that's fixed the problem I should get no warnings oh, we get one warning all oh, right so what's he saying uh, we're still getting one more warning um, but it's oh it's, it's from a new area now oh, very odd so this is now coming actually from salt itself uh, uh, from the tornado which uh, Uh, is, tornado, is Tornado the new reactor? No. Hmm. Okay, let's try. Tornado. Uh, there you go. Uh, oh, they are non blocking REST API for salt. Okay, uh, so that looks like it will require an update to salt. Now, I do know a recent update for salt was released, so it may be that that's fixed uh, by doing an update to salt. Mm. No guarantees, of course. Uh, I suppose we could try that. Uh, do we want to do that now? No, we'll leave it. Okay, so so uh, going back to uh, our serve salt. So we're back to our salt configuration now, uh, and we've got. Uh, uh, so test infra that is just installing our test infrastructure. It's not doing any of the running of our test infrastructure. To do that, we would go elsewhere and we would use PyTest. So and that's fine. Um, you know, there's no no reason to do it any other way, really. Um, if we wanted to do it, uh, we could use uh, Salt Runner uh, locally. Yeah. Um, what's the point? Is making things more complicated than it needs to be. Anyway, we've got the we've got the test in place now. Uh, in order to get that test to pass, because um, if you remember, we did a manual install just to prove a point. Um, in order to get that to pass, okay, um, what we need to do is we need to get uh, servers one and two. Uh, to both have uh, NFT uh, NF tables uh, installed. Uh, one thing we wanted to check though was whether or not we needed NF tables installed at all. Because we're going to be using the salt NF tables module. Uh, so if we look at uh, yeah, yeah. Salt modules, NF tables. Yeah, there's nothing in here that suggests we need NF tables actually installed. Although I'd be very surprised if we didn't. Uh, and NF tables is 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 fairly straightforward um, insofar as all it really does is pass these rules on, presumably to be processed by NF tables. Now it could be. That the NF tables module itself will in, will, will install uh, NF tables. Um, so we need to uh, consider uh, 
what we actually want to achieve. And what we want to achieve is the setup for our firewall, the initial setup for our firewall. So to do that, uh, okay. So our initial firewall, we've got to, uh, we've got we've got two interfaces on each of the machines. Okay, so we've got two machines. Well, okay, let's draw this up. We've got one host. Okay, and within that host, we are running a virtual box environment. Okay, and within that virtual box environment, we are running two VMs. Okay, SRV001, which is our master, and SRV002 which is going to be our network box. <clears throat> okay, now things get a bit complicated here. Uh, but in essence, uh, what we have, uh, our best to draw this so we don't get ourselves drowning in stuff. Okay. So each of these machines uh, at the moment has got two network interfaces. Okay, so it's got Ethernet zero on each machine. Uh, and each machine also has Ethernet one. Now this Ethernet 1 are the machines that we created uh, when we configured the machine. Ethernet 0 is the default. Okay. Now Ethernet 0, these two interfaces, okay, are for our purposes, uh, they're required for Vagrant to work. And if you remember Vagrant, it's just a management system that runs outside on the host, okay, and it uses SSH to do the management, okay. So we need port 22 on each of these machines to be available for Vagrant, okay, and we make that available through Ethernet 2. But there's a bit of a gotcha. These two interfaces are also the default gateway uh, at the moment uh, for both machines. Okay, so if I want to install a package and this thing runs uh, APT, for example, to get the package, it uses Ethernet Zero and goes straight out to the internet and straight back in again. Uh, it doesn't go via our um, via any interface that we want uh, so so for example if i run apt on server one it'll go out through the default gateway which is ethernet zero out to the internet and get the package what we want it to do is we want it to go to server two which is going to be our router okay and we want it to go out to the router and then from here to go out to the internet Okay, and then it can go via Ethernet Zero. Now, this is actually going to be emulating the set, the the, the real setup, <laughs> real setup. Uh, so the real physical machines will be server zero zero one. Okay, which will have an interface. Uh, it will probably be called something like EN uh, P zero S or something like that yeah uh, it doesn't really matter uh, and server 2 uh, we'll get onto why it's called that some other time uh, now this server will actually have a whole load of interfaces all right now it will have one uh, p0s1 uh, and that will be 
the gateway out to the internet. I mean, it actually goes out to the modem, uh, then out to the internet. Right. Uh, so this is our default gateway. But this EMPS01 Okay, so this one, and let's say this one, let's say ENP1, yes, one. Uh, okay, so th these two are on one one. Okay, so they're on the, the local network, yeah? uh, and they will have the IP addresses that we're assigning. Yeah, which are one nine two one six eight dot one because that's our land one subnet dot uh, now in the case of server two its address is two five four and this one has an address one nine two dot one six eight dot one again we're on the land one subnet dot two by three uh, and all traffic that goes from server one so this is the default gateway on that machine so all traffic that goes out to say the internet goes out of here across LAN one is then routed from there out through there and to the to the internet Okay, and that's why this is called our router. It's actually our gateway router. Uh, and in actual fact, any other machines that we put on here will similarly go through LAN1 and be routed out to the internet. Okay, these other interfaces, one of them is going to be a private subnet. Okay, which will be similarly routed out to the internet, but will be better protected. Okay, because it will actually go out from our VPN and various other things, but you don't need to worry about the details of that right now. Okay, uh, when we get round to it, we will be adding we'll be adding more interfaces to our simulated server two uh, in order to in order to, in order to, in order to demonstrate in order to replicate it. So, uh, looking at this. And comparing it to this, uh, we can see that this interface, okay, is the equivalent to Ethernet zero, okay. So that is the equivalent to this interface, and this interface, which is the uh, the one interface on server one, okay, is not equivalent to Ethernet. It's equivalent to this one, okay, because it's on. This is on our simulated LAN one, and this interface uh, is on our simulated one. Yeah, All right. So. When server one makes a query that goes out to the internet, we want it to go out through this default gateway. Okay, so that will no longer be the default gateway. All traffic will go out of here, over our simulated LAN one, be routed through our router and out through and to our internet connection. All right? Which you can see is basically the same is what we're doing here. Now in order to get this to work uh, the way we want it to, there are a few things to note. The first thing to note is that we've got different interface names. Okay, These are all called Ethernet 0, Ethernet 1 and so on. And in the final machine they're going to be called something like ENP01S1. Now that's because uh, the naming convention for interfaces has changed. Uh, the old style Ethernet 1, the ETH, okay, 
uh, was unreliable. Uh, don't get me wrong, it required some fairly special circumstances, but it, it, it was unreliable because when you have more than one interface, uh, there was no real way of guaranteeing that the two interfaces, other than to define them statically, uh, there was no way of guaranteeing that the two interfaces okay, were going to come up in the correct order. So it was perfectly feasible that Ethernet 0 and Ethernet 1 would be swapped over. So although they would be called Ethernet 0 and Ethernet 1, they wouldn't physically correspond to the same network interface card. And that's precisely why this new naming convention was born, because this naming convention guarantees uh, that these names will always refer to the same network interface card. Okay, In other words, they'll be physically connected to the same network. And so this is always the preferred name. For various reasons, Vagrant uh, currently uh, relies on this being called Ethernet Zero. Now I don't entirely, I'm not entirely sure that this is universally true anymore, but what I do know is on our bento box here, uh, if I do IPA, that's the names of the cards. And short of going in and screwing me around with it, okay, that's the way it is. Now I'm going to leave it this way because it's a good, it's a good lesson, uh, and that lesson is this: in our configuration, okay, we've got two environments. Let's call it our development and test environment, which is our vagrant environment, compared to our production environment, and we've got a problem we've got the two different interface names. So the question is, how do I, within my salt, have one configuration that will work equally well, whether it's in test or in production? Now, salt does have the concept of environment built into it. Uh, if you look at this top file, Okay, you'll notice this base. Uh, now that position there, the top level um, uh, of, of this of the dictionary defined by top SLS, basically. Okay, the top level is the environment. So we could uh, uh, okay. Uh, we could, for example, have another thing down here called dev, okay, and this would be the specification for our development environment. And we could say, well, okay, anything in dev uh, is for development, and we could have another one for production. Uh, and that's fine for the gross level stuff, right? But what we're talking about here is the name of an interface. Uh, and to maintain two completely separate uh, state trees just for different network cards would just be a nightmare, okay? And it's, it, you know, just a moment's thought, you realize that that is really dumb. Yeah? You would end up with the potential, if you, if you did that for every single variable within your configuration, you, you'd end up, it, it would just be madness, okay? What that top level environment really is about is defining, for example, uh, fundamentally different architectural decisions. Uh, so, for example, you might um, you might have a situation where in your production environment, okay, you've got your gateway router being an appliance. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't apply in our case. Uh, it doesn't apply in our case because this server 2 is going to be a jack of all trades uh, for our network stuff. Yeah? But it's not, it's not too difficult to imagine that in a real system, uh, you know, a, uh, a large enterprise system for example, that you would have you know, a router appliance, uh, let's call it a gateway router appliance, doing all of the gateway routing. Uh, you might have another appliance doing DHCP, 
uh, and yet another appliance uh, acting as your name server. Now we've got all three of these running on a single machine, yeah, but it's quite conceivable that it would be three separate machines in your production environment. But it may be considered unnecessary in your, let's say, system test environment. You may decide to group all three of those functions on a single. Yeah. You've got a great way router, DHCP, and name server all on one server. Yeah. And, and therefore, th this is a fundamental architectural difference. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this might be identified as production device one, production device two, and production device three. Uh, so in our salt configuration, uh, within our top file, uh, we might have something like uh, base blah blah blah. Uh, we we'll have dev. Come back to that in a second. Okay, and we would have prod and in here we would have prod device one maps to let's call it the gateway router state uh, prod device two maps to dhcp uh, and prod device three maps to name server okay so you've got three different states are being applied to three different means but these states over here, uh, when you do the development work, because this is just development device one, under your dev configuration, you just have development device one, maps two, and then you put a gateway router, uh, DHCP, and name server, all on a single device. Okay, so you can see, although the low level states are the same, they're divided up differently, yeah, so architecturally there's a difference between production, there. and that's where that's where the use of the salt state, uh, the salt environments, are more useful. We'll look later at another way of doing it, uh, and I think a better way, uh, because for various reasons, salt environments can be a bit of a dog's breakfast, uh, but they're there, um, and, and that's what they're more useful for. Uh, they're not more, they're not useful for um, things that are just just variables. Uh, it would be a nightmare uh, to have you know every single time we had a difference in uh, the name of an interface. Uh, it would be a complete nightmare. Uh, for example, let's say uh, I suddenly decided one day that server one was going to be um, a, 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 an OSX machine. Uh, well, they're not called Ethernet 1, uh, uh, they're called EN1, uh, or EN0, or Ethernet 0 and EN0. And so they're, they're EN rather than ETH, so it's a different naming convention again. Uh, and I, I don't want to have to go and create a whole new uh, configuration just because of that. How do we deal with this then? Well, there are basically three possibilities. Uh, we could deal with it by mine data, we could deal with it by grain data, or we could deal with it by a pillar. Now, grain data. We could read uh, what the list of uh, interfaces was from the grain data. Okay, remember, we can do something like this. Uh, 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 that warning is going to get very irritating very quick, isn't it? Uh, uh, oh my. Uh, am I? Are we having a seizure? Uh, wait a second. 
Mm -hmm. oh, brain leaking out my ears this morning. Mm -hmm. It's not green directly. That's not that's not the way you do it. Um Oh, come on, Mark. Mm, oh, items. <sighs> right, so if you do it that way, right, but we don't want to do it that way because you can see we get an awful lot of nonsense. Uh, but we'll see that we can get the list of interfaces uh, so we can get it this way with IP4 interfaces for example yeah. uh, so we can do <coughs> right so we can do it this way uh, which gets us the Ethernet 1, Ethernet 2 um, interfaces on server 1 and server 2. Uh, and you can see that the Ethernet 1 are the ones that are on our local network, and Ethernet 2 is this 10215, which is the default IP address given to the Ethernet interface on the virtual box control in interface, for want of a better description. Yeah. <coughs> uh, anyway, um, the long and the short of it is that uh, we don't want to do it that way because it still doesn't tell us which interface performs which function. Now what we could do is define grain data. So we could define our own grains, which said something like this. So we could go to We can go to salt, mm -hmm. and within here, we can define uh, grains. Uh, and I think it goes in the minion directory. Uh, there we go. So you can you can either define them like this, you know, as grains within the minion configuration file, okay, or uh, we can put them in uh, a grains file on its own. Yeah. So we can either uh, use um, uh, we can either put it in here uh, at the end of this file or somewhere in that file, or we can say, okay, we'll have our own greens data in here, yeah? and we can put in here something like this. Um, let's call it. Uh, uh, let's call it our 
uh, interface uh, interface map and then we can do something like this we can say the wide area network is ethernet zero and uh, lan is ethernet one for example yeah. if there can only be one of course rather than make it an array we can just put it in like this okay yeah so we can we, you know we can define it like that uh, and then in order to get that green data installed we'd need to then restart the minion uh, so we need to do because its configuration is only ready at the beginning uh, so now if we were to do uh, da, 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 and we get the interface map you can see here that for server one it's defined okay and now anywhere in our configuration we can use this we can use this interface map LAN uh, and know that we've got the uh, that, that will map to the correct interface now we can use interface map WAN and get the correct interface uh, so in our configuration uh, if we go back to um, go back to here uh, and we could for example uh, define our network in here so we could take our top SLS uh, and we could uh, oops, we could do uh, file We can have our firewall configuration, um, and in here we could say um, no, a block rule uh, it could be something like uh, well, you know, whatever, yada yada, uh, NF table. Uh, blah 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 and then when we want you to put in our interface instead of putting it like ethernet zero we would put in uh, the grain okay and we could do that by just saying uh, grain and then the name of the grain but as we learned earlier that's less uh, effective than doing something like this grains.get uh, and then it would be uh, interface map uh, uh, one for example and we can provide uh, ethernet zero as a default I mean it doesn't make any sense because of course We'd much rather have it fail uh, because Ethernet Zero might exist. Let's just do it like that. Like that. Okay. Uh, so that would that would get the the grain data uh, necessary, uh, and that would expand to be Ethernet Zero. Okay. So that would be the way we would do it with grains. Um, so what's the problem with doing that? Well. Uh, there's no real problem with doing that. Uh, uh, the, the downside, as you can see, uh, and it makes a certain amount of sense because that information is tied to the physical machine. Uh, it's not. It's not something that is likely to change independent of the machine changing. So, you know, once a network interface card is attached to a network, that's it. It's tied to the network. 
Um, the fact that we're using uh, a sort of pseudonymous naming for Wham and Lamb, that could be something that would change. Uh, uh, you know, we, we might call it, uh, we might decide instead of Lamb, we want to call it Lamb Wong. And if we want to change the name, uh, we would need to change the grain data for each minion. Uh, and that would mean editing that grains file and then restarting the salt minion, uh, which is not a great idea. Uh, now, there are ways of restarting the salt minion from within salt, and we might look at that later. Uh, but we don't want to be restarting uh, a minion when we don't really need to. Which brings us to uh, mine data. Now we can do a similar sort of thing with mines where the mine can self-report all its interfaces and then we can take that data and we could use that data to do a similar thing, uh, map it. Mine data in this instance is a really crappy idea uh, because it doesn't do what we really want it to do. The mine data would be reported from the minion and would then be available to all the other minions, uh, potentially via the master. Um, yeah, ignore mine data. It's 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 a possibility, but it's irrelevant in this context. We'll 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 cover a good reason for using mine data, uh, particularly when we start looking at the cloud and sort of dynamic interfaces. Uh, sorry, dynamic environments. Uh, Mind data can be quite useful in those contexts uh, where you've got constantly changing uh, configuration. Uh, for example, the IP address of machines can change. So that can be, uh, uh, and that could be used to, uh, for example, update um, name server mappings. Um, although there are better ways of doing that as well. But that's a whole other story. But, I'm just blathering now. Anyway, pillar data. So the other way of the other source of primary source of data is we've got grains, and the other primary source of data is pillars. Now, pillar data you can modify on the master and basically modify on the fly. You don't need to restart anything. Pillar data is read dynamically, more or less. It is cached, and that can bite you in the ass. So just be aware of the fact that. Pillar data can be cached. So can green data, by the way. But pillar data can be cached. Um, and that caching can sometimes catch you out. Where, you know, you change something, you'll forget that it's been cached, and then you'll rerun your states, nothing will change, and you'll be left scratching your head. Uh, and we'll talk about a good habit to get into. Uh, in terms of doing major updates. If you're doing minor updates, it's not so much of an issue. If you're doing minor updates to your configuration, it's usually fairly obvious, fairly quickly. But if you're running high state across thousands of machines, uh, you really want to do like a pillar data refresh as a matter of course. Uh, the cost of doing the refresh and clearing out the cache and, and recaching stuff is comparatively small to running high state across a thousand machines only to get to the end of it to find nothing's happened because your pillar data was cached and ah, disaster. Right? Now pillar data is defined on the master and it only leaves the master uh, when a minion requests data. Now the minion will, can only request its own pillar data. Okay, and this is where it differs from uh, mine data. So your pillar data sits on uh, the master, and the master will define for each uh, minion what pillar data is available. At the moment, we've got uh, no pillar data. So if we do um, uh, uh, oh, I stand corrected. I, I have defined some. <laughs> Uh, okay, so there's our pillar data. Yeah, I, I had defined some. I'd forgotten about that. <coughs> but the point is, you can see here, uh, it's uh, first of all, uh, it's defined uh, by 
minion, uh, then uh, the actual pillar data is defined. Uh, now, if uh, and I think we've gone through this already, if I'm on server one and I run from server one something like uh, assault, assault call, uh, which actually interacts with the minion, not with the master. So this is uh, if I if I go on here and do okay, uh, pillar dash items. Come on, Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's gonna be horrible. Right. Pillar dot items. There we go. We're getting lots of warnings coming out, which is unfortunate. But uh, right, there we go. So you can see here, uh, this is just referring to uh, pillar one data. Yeah, so if I go back to the generic, okay, you can see the pillar one data was just my packages VM tree. Okay, and here you got pillar, yeah. So the minion does not have any access to anything other than its own data. Okay, and you can do the same thing over here by doing salt call pillar items salt call pillar items okay so again it's the minion is making the request of the master and the master says well this is your pillar data okay server 2 uh, and so that's the only data that we see over here Okay, which makes it quite good for, uh, yeah, it's, it's a fairly secure way of um, making sure that uh, information that is relevant to one part of your system is not available to every other part of the system. Right. What does all this have to do with the interfaces? Well, the point is that if we go to the uh, pillar data, oops, oops, if you're actually on the right machine, uh, okay. So now, if I now go to uh, 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 my top, okay, and in here, okay, I will do uh, server two. Uh, let's get let's create server one. Okay, so I can do something like this. Uh, let's call this server one. Well, let's call, actually, let's call it interface map dot s one. Okay, and uh, down here, I can do interface dot s two. Okay, so now I can make a directory interface map, and in here I can create an s one dot sls. Okay. And I can call it interface map. And I can say one one is Ethernet zero and LAN is Ethernet one. Okay. And I can copy interface map S1 to interface map S2. Right. So now when I look at the pillar data, uh, my interface map now appears in in here, and so in my uh, in my salt data I can do something very similar. Now the advantage, as you can see, this data becomes immediately available. I don't need to restart anything; it's just there. So if I go into uh, interface map S two, for example, uh, I can change those around. Okay, so I can so I'll call that interface one and that interface zero. Uh, 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 did I? Yeah, I did write it. Good. Um, so now, uh, uh, and now I've got one, zero, zero, and one. All right, so I can. Uh, Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, it's because these are alphabetically sorted. Yeah, I'm sorry, that was doing my idiom for a minute. I couldn't work out why that was one and that was zero. It's because uh, LAN and WAN are so alphabetically sorted in here, but they're not when I define them. Uh, the long and the short is though, you can see that LAN is Ethernet 1 over here and Ethernet 0 on server 2. So I didn't need to restart anything. The pillar data became immediately available, and I could I could have changed them, and I could change the names, and I could do whatever I wanted in here, and it wouldn't be affected. Okay, so I can now go uh, back to my uh, sort data, and I could in here. Uh, you remember uh, that if I wanted to include a particular value, uh, I can do uh, the the same thing. Okay. Uh, But this time uh, I would use the pillar reference in map one. Uh, okay, and, and that would be replaced with whichever interface was relevant. Okay, so that is uh, uh, a more flexible way of doing it. Uh, as we go on, we use sort more and more, you'll see that there are a lot more ways of doing it. It's, for example, uh, we'll eventually we'll put on, um, particularly when we're in the cloud, we're going to put on a more flexible system of, of this kind of information where we have key value pairs stored in uh, a distributed system, okay, and we can get them directly. We don't have to even go back to the sort master. Yeah, that's a whole other story. Um, right. So. Uh, in this context, I think using the uh, pillar data makes more sense, particularly since, uh, for our purposes, it's going to be a standard set uh, other than for a few exceptions. Right? So, for example, uh, I can go back to the pillar data uh, and I can go into the interface map uh, for, say, S1. And since since all of them are going to be of this form, what I could do is I could do a copy of uh, S. Uh, I could copy interface map S one, and I could copy that to interface map. Let's call it common. Okay, and now I can remove uh, interface map. S1 and inside my top uh, I don't need this anymore what I do need though is in my base in star in other words for everything okay I can do come on uh, so now I can do okay show me the pillar items okay so you can see for this one it's got the server one and it's got a LAN map to Ethernet 1 and LAN map to Ethernet 0 okay and that has come from common this however has got LAN as Ethernet 0 and WAN as Ethernet 1 yeah? and it's got that from s2.sls in my pillar because it's specific to servers 2 Okay, so if I were to change interface map S2 uh, and call that, uh, let's say that was interface 10. Okay, it, it's just a bit more obvious than what's going on. So you can see uh, that's picked up 10, but that's still Ethernet 0, which is the one for all other servers. Yeah. <clears throat> so we can now do configuration by exception where the exception is in here. Now you have to be a bit careful because if I were to delete that one uh, uh, now, uh, now we get the rather bizarre thing where we've got a LAN map to Ethernet 0 and one map to Ethernet 0. Why? Well, in common, one is Ethernet 0, but in S2, uh, LAN is Ethernet 0. Okay, so we've now got the WAN and the LAN both on the same interface card, which is um, it's possible, <laughs> uh, but not necessarily what we wanted. Right? 
Uh, it largely depends on what these pillar values are for, but just something to be aware of. You can do this overloading um, where you know one, 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 one configuration overloads another, um, uh, and they're, they're merged in, in the order in which they appear within your top file. Uh, so as long as you put the more specific stuff later, you'll be fine. Um, uh, so that's the way we're going to do it. Uh, we're actually going to have this interface map uh, defined in our pillar data, and then we will use the ginger value replacements uh, for our actual configuration. Uh, now, whether we call them LAN or WAN is another matter. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's a little bit misleading, uh, but not so much um, because it, it kind of is the the, the way, as far as the, the machine is concerned. But having said that, the fact that there will be no WAM on our production system for most servers uh, means that we probably want to define WAN as specific to Ethernet uh, Server 2, uh, but LAN will be LAN 1 will be the generic for everything else. Yeah? So what we'll end up with is uh, our interface map common will only define the LAN. Uh, and our interface map for S2 is the only one that will define a WAN. Uh, and in this case, it will be on Ethernet 1. Yeah, so now, uh, uh, only server 2 has got a WAN defined. Okay, but server 2 and server 1 agree that LAN, uh, the Ethernet 1 is the network interface that will be on the LAN. Uh, in fact, let's be even more clear and we'll call that LAN 1. Okay. Okay, so now we can see it uh, helps if you actually uh, put the code on in. Right, <coughs> so uh, yeah, so now we've got lab one. Ethernet one on both machines, but the WAN is only defined on server two, which means that if we try to use that in map WAN anywhere other than server two, uh, we will almost immediately get an error uh, from our salt state because we're trying to configure an interface which doesn't exist. I mean, it does exist, of course, because uh, it exists as Ethernet zero. Which brings me to my next point, and that is that we do want to be able to configure that within our vagrant environment. Okay, so how do we make sure that in our vagrant environment that thing is available, and we'll call it uh, the vint, uh, or the vagrant interface, because we want to make sure that we close that off. Okay, so uh, to do that, um, we need a way of detecting that we are running on Vagrant and I think we'll save that for tomorrow uh, when we'll start putting all this together uh, and start defining our firewall for, for real 